Good morning, everybody. Thank you to Biofilm for inviting us. Apresid, as well, everybody who allows us to work from different areas. With Germán, we prepared the presentation and we were talking about what was the role of biotechnology and regenerative agriculture. To make it simple, good morning, everybody. My name is Herman Avancini. I am in the development of biofilm. And before I begin, and apologizing because we started a bit late for biofilm, this is a very important time because we have been participating in more and more events. We are a company that produces biotechnology and that biotechnology is something the market demands more and more in the area that we work in. In that sense, the talk will go, we will speak about this and the dynamic is a given in how biotechnology impacts regional agriculture. My question is seeing what we were speaking about and on the base of this title is whether we see a change or what changes do we see that worries us. Uh, okay, answering your question, there are two news that are very fresh from July this year. One is that the massive use of herbicides is really bad for production. The university has said that sorry, in corn it's 13, in soy it's 19, and in some way the use of herbicides and pesticides uh, in the wrong application and the bad management when it comes to applying it can explain the problems that we have in agriculture right now. In another report in July this year from the uh, from NGOs, have said that productive areas such as the north of Córdoba, Santiago del Estero, the north of Santa Fe, you can see a deficiency in zinc and in the north, east and north, there is a loss of the organic horizon and many of those soils have not o sea, been hay... in agriculture for so long. So there is something that we're doing wrong in agriculture right now. And that's why we want to go for a regenerative agriculture. So regenerative agriculture, is it too different from the agriculture that we use now? We were doing it without knowing. We were already into it. This is the definition that I got from the US, from an organization that works on regenerative agriculture for the past 50 years. Uh, it focuses predominantly in restoring the agricultural um, ecosystems, not as production systems, but agricultural ecosystems. And it focuses on the health of the soil. It gives a great importance to the carbon footprint and diversity when it comes to biodiversity, when it comes to exploiting agriculture and managing water. So what this institute seeks to do is to improve the productive ecosystem by preserving the resources, especially water, which is finite as a resource. And if you misuse it, they will uh, falter. There are five pillars to be based on. These are the principles for regenerative agriculture, mainly to reduce or eliminate the uh, tipping uh, tillage. Um, in Argentina, we have been working for ages, or we introduced this to maintain 
the soil covered with crops most of the year. We speak a lot about coverage in a system of rotation and to use less herbicides to diversify uh, different crops to uh, encourage uh, the root development and to integrate cattle to production systems. When it comes to soil, there are three pillars or principles that are very basic to develop or to encourage or stimulate the three M's that they call for the soil to improve the biogeochemical of chemicals, of minerals, to encourage organic matter and to, uh, to encourage microorganisms. We speak about biotechnology and of these three M's, which are very interesting. How does this affect uh, the biotechnology? Biotechnology is the introduction of a live organism in something to seek that something to trigger something positive. We can define this or we can take this through bio inputs. And if we want a classical definition of this, this is something said by all experts, is any substance or microorganism that put on the plant, on the soil or the seed can have a positive impact. And as the active principle is microorganisms and substances. You can see there that you have protein hydroxylate, amino acids, etc. And what do the, they do, these bio inputs? We can do several things that are very interesting to favor the plant. We can assimilate nutrients better, root development, improve uh, soil water um, captation. And there are many interesting things. They exclude heavy metals and they don't go to the plant. There are fungus which can control pathogens and nematodes. Uh, it can improve the organic matter. It can improve root growth, including adding new organic matter year on year and having nutrients that may be soluble in the soil when we do it, when we apply it to foliage, that also improves things. This is a graph that we've been seeing a lot. We've been seeing this for a long time when we began speaking about bio inputs. And my question and what we think from this availability of biostimulants and bioinputs is whether these bioinputs have a target and what is the methodology to you that is most efficient to incorporate them to agriculture. I'm going to show you the following slide, which is a picture, and it's very clear. You may say, you can see many things there. If you see the background you will see spectacular maize or corn in development in color. And right next to it, you have peanuts. The type of soil and the variation is not so big from one side to the other. So how can you explain the fact that the crop that demands so much in the case of corn can be so fantastic and peanuts, which is going into flowering process, begins to demand and there's something missing. That corn had biofertilizers, and here we have a classical example of inoculated, badly inoculated, and the question is the seed. Today, this is the most efficient way to have a bio input through the seeds. But there are some cases that you can see that when we check on the stress, this goes on the foliage for regulation. This is a classic of the biological fixation of nitrogen. Peanuts can really show how 
important the fixation is, and this is a process that we have that we don't always do right. When we talk about the data here, what I want to ask is that regenerative agriculture should be something that we want to achieve in our daily work. I think any of us would ask, the biological nitrogen fi fixation, is it a practice of the way that we work in regenerative agriculture? Yes, of course, it is a practice that is not given its rightful importance. This is something that we carried out with Olega in 2023. This shows the importance of the treatment of seeds for the campaign of 22-23 with very uh, droughty conditions. Uh, we were talking about when you have the crop, we had 2,800 kilos per hectares. 36% of that is raw protein fixed on the grain. So most of it is on the grain itself. But if that 36% is divided by the nitrogenated constant, it means that that crop to yield what it has, I need 165 kilograms of nitrogen. And where does this nitrogen come from as an element? Because the yield was there. The soil, and this is in Balcarce, this is the general ratio for Argentina. Organic matter, 1.5.2. In peanut, it is more struck, so less organic matter. The mineralization rate is from 2 to 4 percent. That's going to give you 40, 50 kilograms per hectare. When it comes to um, the remnant in the soil in rotation and in the cycles of regeneration of residue, 30 to 40 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So that may give us between 70 or 90 kilograms per hectare. The root cannot capture due to its architecture 100% of that soil, 75% is pretty high in efficiency. So of that available nitrogen, 60 kilos was what the soil could take, but we needed 165 nitrogen. So the balance is 105 kilograms, it's here in red. Where does that come from? From the biological nitrogen fixation. And to explain that yield of 2,800 kilos, 64% of the nitrogen that the plant used comes from the BNF. Going a bit deeper and faster, what happens when we mix bioinputs or microorganisms with hormones? You know that plants are regulated by many hormones. The main ones are auxins, gibberellins, and cytokines. When the, uh, there is flowering, cytokines, gibberellins, we are speaking about that. Uh, they go to the root. This is the right combination between bio-input and inoculant and the effect on the stand of plant and growth. We can see in um, peanuts, which are sowed in October, we can see an improvement in the uh, growth. When we go more advanced, we can see that the inoculated peanut has developed well, but I have more foliage and better development in the inoculated plus the PGPR. So what happens with the root when it when then? We're going too fast, I think. 
so pay attention. Uh, when it's with herbicides, it's almost uh, it has no nod nodules, and this is inoculated plus hormones. When we go to soy, it's the same. This is from Jose in Villa Maria, and we improved the growth and the effect on the plant. And if everything goes well, what we saw at, underneath the soil, we can see it in yield at the top. Because what happens when I put something to the seed, in the middle there's many months until I can have the plant. So when you talk about the treatment of the seeds, there is value there for vigorous growth, the coefficient, the uniform distribution, and with a target of 100%. So that is very important, and it's something we don't measure. We always measure the yield, but in the middle, there's things that happen. And this is when we mix a nutrient such as zinc for cereals. This is uh, hops auxins and gibberellins, and the same, this uh, seeds, but we have uh, a powder which has carbonate of calcium, zinc, auxins, and gibberellins. We don't wet the seed, we don't change the distribution profile. We just put like talcum powder on it. And With this product, we are also improving biological efficiency with nitrogen. We are also improving the final also contributing other nutrients to the soil, such as colloids. We work with Visia with uh, peas, and the results are uh, similar. So, bio inputs for phosphorus has, uh, is a topic that has been dealt with for some years. So, making phosphorus soluble with this type of bio inputs would replace chemical fertilization. And this uh, has to do with many questions. These are kind of borderline questions. Think about the context of the Russia-Ukrainian war, and there was a, a growth that tripled, and we got lots of consultations. The phosphorus solute Solu solution does not replace. It helps capture the nutrient that is expensive. So, these products work at the level of the organic phosphorus that follows the chemical 
structure through the mineralization of, of phosphorus, and making it available for the plant. When the geochemical part is considered, phosphorus is linked to aluminum phosphate. So there, there are some microorganisms that have enzymes that release that triple bond and the plant can absorb this. So the question goes the other way around. If we introduce a chemical fertilizer that has a certain cost, the question is how much product, for example, 10 kilos of PDA, how much is captured by the plant? And the answer could be 100 kilos. So making phosphorus soluble, I can make this equation more efficient. I can reach 30 or 35 percent. So I will make it more effective, but it will not be a replacement. It will be a supplement. to do with an integrated management of pests. So the question is, are bio inputs more efficient as part of integrated uh, pest management? So the idea is this bio input individually or as part of a more general program. I am doing training in biocontrol and I advocate for biocontrol, but I believe we are not fully prepared as producers to handle this topic. If you look at it from the seed perspective, you can manage, but 100% biological or organic production is not possible. If we go back to the definition of regenerative agriculture, it is not the same as 100% organic agriculture. It has to do with integrating biological elements in the traditional processes. This is our vision as a company. We integrate the biocontrollers or the bio inputs in the integrated management of crops. I believe we are not so far away from this idea to have some kind of monitoring, biomonitoring in seed treatment, but we need to have a certification system. And this will allow us to go forward. The seed has to be produced and processed and managed as a seed and not uh, classifying the lot of grains. Yes, I believe we are, we need to go step by step. I agree, but even though in some crops, biocontrol is an important component as part of the integrated uh, pest control, we can combine a bacillus with other kind of treatments for peanut crops. We can also see 
how certain uh, organisms uh, survive. We see the combined effect of bacillus in the stage of germination. And when we go beyond the dual antagonism tests, I don't know if we are prepared to do this. But there's something I would like to add. All of this can be done in addition to other things for seeds and for what we have in the soil. And we need to take this into account. Yes. As Lucre is saying, this is 100% biological. These are treatments for plants in pots. And here you can see the biocontrollers versus the pathogen and the positive control. The same in this case for Fusarium. So far, the target method is to include these elements through the seeds, as we have shown so far. But we can also say that the bio inputs can be managed at the foliage level. Part of those uh, bio inputs that are available today have compound diversity. So can you please say how they will contribute to biotic and abiotic stress management? What is their role? As Luque is saying, for this kind of stress, the biotic stress has to do with plagues or pests, and the abiotic um, stress has to do with the environment and incorrect management by uh, humans can lead to toxicity. And here we see peanut crops that are heavily stressed. Until we get rainfall, there's nothing we can do. Uh, the first way to de-stress this crop is water. Water will help me in that direction. Last uh, week, we were in Pehuajó, and they asked about wheat. The environmental conditions are highly severe. For wheat, if we are able to understand how many millimeters we have in the soil and there is stress. And on Friday, there was some rainfall in some areas. So we can use some preventive methods because the environmental conditions are less demanding. Now, of a substance that is called proline. When the plant is stressed, the membranes are destabilized. The two gray bars show the application of auxin. The accumulation of proline is uh, slowed down when the auxins are introduced. But the most important point here is the same chart We have different bars showing with auxin or without auxin the results that we get. So what is this telling me? There are two processes in the life of a plant, photosynthesis and also breathing. Think about corn in a stressful situation. What does corn do? The leaves are uh, damaged, and the, photo, 
the possibility of photosynthesis is reduced. So there is a mechanism that is slowed, that is slowed down and breathing is at the optimum level. So oxy, oxidate, oxidation occurs and this is a reaction that has to do with oxygen. When I introduce oxygens, I can slow down this process and I can detox the We planted seven days later, but we get the same volume of foliage and uh, branches. So we use it for early planting and also for late planting and have well-developed crops. And we are going down the path of foliage bio inputs. So, so far we have given you an overview. This is to show that Argentina is using bio inputs increasingly. We are trying to do it more efficiently, taking care of the environment and understanding that biological inputs are finite. So we need to be aware of this. And it is also key to try to find production of food without toxicity, without residue and, uh, well, food that is um, good for the industry. Do you have any questions? I have one question. considerations should we have when we have a mix of bio inputs and chemicals? And another question is, with all the combination of bio inputs and bio stimulants, do we have clear roles of what, do we understand their roles? Let me start by the second question. We now know the composition of active ingredients in order to look for specific results. I was talking with some producers in Pehuajó, and these are active ingredients. We need to find the correct ones, and we need to apply them at the right time for the specific situation. So the hard part of research and development has to do with concrete applications. So as regards the other question, what was it about? What, what should we take into account when we have a biological chemical, we generally consider it for seeds, but 
The same goes for foliage products. We should make the chemical and the biological compatible in a way. We can do that sequentially for seeds, for instance, we can apply the chemical first, then the biological one. If we are going to mix them, we can do that, but let us use this combination or this mixture in the short term. And as regards products for foliage, the ones that are designed to regulate stress have more to do with fungicides. For instance, for peanuts, we use fungicides. And we also have bio-inputs for foliage. And the restrictions um, are not so important here because living organisms are not used uh, so much here. For seed treatment, we need to have compatibility tests. Yes, of course. Hello, congratulations on your talk. It's been very, very thorough. I understand that you represent a company, so you have the chance to work in several areas, and that's where my question goes. You spoke about the fact that there are some situations that have encouraged the use of bioinputs, such as the war in Russia, and you're also with the producers working with them. My question is, what are the limits that you see today? when it comes to bio-inputs and the use of producers, and what opportunities to encourage the use of bio-inputs. First of all, the limitation when I said that what, because let's go back to what I said before and what Lucrecia asked. What was the main way of introducing productive systems? And today is still the seed. So a lot of that is uh, with a demand for yield. And people say sometimes, oh, I didn't see any change, or I didn't have the result that I expected. And perhaps in November, I sowed it. In May, I took it up, and I didn't see the result. That's when it comes to seeds. And many times when it comes to foliage, it doesn't give me a yield, but it actually de-stressed the plant. And perhaps if I didn't do anything, the yield would have been below what I had. So from that point of view, the bioinput uh, is thought of as a chemical fertilizer, as if it was a herbicide or a chemical. And it is not that. Here we must think of the uh, small effects. And anybody who says to you about a result that's over 11% for a biological bioinput is not telling you the truth. I'm telling you, as a company that formulates these bioinputs, and all of my sales team is here, because the the Response is five, six, seven, or eight percent for bioinputs, up to ten, but it is not generally that. What I see is that we, I am an agricultural person as well. We look in the short term. We see the immediate effect, and that is not. It is something to do with our system, with the uncertainty when it comes to prices, when it comes to many issues. So that's where that short-term vision of wanting to have immediate results when we invest. And there are many things that we don't see because with the fungus that is used, for example, biocontrol or bacteria or bacillus that are used on the soil, that soil ends up having a lot of optimal conditions for the health of the soil that you don't necessarily see. That's what it has to do. 
regenerative agriculture is that. You leave young organic matter, you will not see the result in yield, but you will gain of a resource that is finite. These are all things that you must look closely at. It's beyond yield, and that's why they have not exploded. The market is more and more going towards that.